Hey, that was amazing. Thank you, Pastor Dusty and your team for leading us in worship. And uh, just, it's crazy um, as a community gathering together for worship, uh, gathering together for communion, and uh, uh, just praying together. We, we live kind of in a crazy world right now. It's a little bit chaotic, and we understand that. Uh, but we know that God is in control and that God is sovereign in all things. And, and let me tell you what we're experiencing today. Uh, we're going to share stories of what Corona 2020 uh, meant to us and the stories that we share. And you will share this story, what we're doing today, of one church gathering together, or four churches gathering together as one church, and uh, just exciting. And so we're just excited to come together to Resurrection Sunday to remember. Let me tell you, I love your pastors, honestly. Uh, as we've gathered together, we've laughed together, we've probably cried a little bit together, I'm sure. Well, yesterday we cried a little bit. And, uh, but I love your pastor. If you love your pastor, hey, show him some love somehow. Uh, maybe in the chat box, say, hey, I love my pastor, or give him a thumbs up, or whatever you want to do. Don't send him a text right now, because it would be distracting to them. But uh, I do love your pastors, and we pray uh, for your pastor, we pray for your church on a fairly regular basis uh, at FSN, and so we're just, we're just part of a community, a faith community that we want to be together. And so as we gathered together uh, these past couple weeks, um, just planning this service, we kind of landed on um, a passage of Scripture, uh, John chapter 20. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to John chapter 20, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you go to Acts, you kind of went a little bit too far. Back up uh, just a little bit. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, I encourage you to download the YouVersion Bible app. Uh, it's a great um, app to have uh, available, and it's all on there. So Jesus had just had the Passover meal with his disciples. And, um, and we partake of communion this morning. That's kind of remembering that time that they did. He was betrayed. He was put on trial. He was whipped, crucified. He was placed in the tomb. And it says that he rose back from the grave. He, he rose from the dead. The disciples did not yet know this. And this is where we're jumping into this story of John chapter 11. And as we read this passage this morning, you may see something that seems a, a little bit a, a little funny. John refers himself to refers to himself in the third person, the other disciple or the one that Jesus loves. So as we're reading this story, we run into Peter and John. It says in verse one, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, being John, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. I, I, can't, I can imagine Mary Magdalene going to that tomb and being astonished and surprised that the stone was rolled away. She looked in, and the body of Jesus was not there, and she didn't know what else to do. So she ran to the disciples. So it says that Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I didn't realize that it was a race, but John wanted to put that in there, that he got there first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded by itself, separate from the linen. That significance in itself. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So imagine for a second that you are Peter and John. Your best friend, the leader, had just passed away, had just died, had just been crucified. And, and perhaps you had this faulty expectation of what the Messiah was. You, you'd heard all these stories, of the prophecies, you'd read the scripture, and you, you thought what the Messiah was going to be, that he was going to build his kingdom here on this earth. He's going to make things right. He's going to kick out the Roman government. But what does he do? He goes to the cross 
and dies. That's not supposed to be the plan. And so I'm sure there's a lot of questions of, of why did this have to happen? Why did this have to be? And so just imagine as they are running towards the tomb, these questions of why, the disappointment, the, the feelings that they would have. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you can relate to the disappointment that life hasn't turned out the way that you thought it had, should have or that, that you had planned. Maybe you've experienced disappointment in, in your marriage and school and career. Maybe in your parenting and the hopes and thoughts that you had just didn't happen. And you have these questions of, man, why did my career not go as I planned? Why did my marriage not work? Why is, why is my child making the choices that they are making? Why am I not able to make ends meet? And, and suddenly, the disciples hear this news. Mary Magdalene comes running to them and gives us this news, and they start running to the tomb. And I'm sure as they're running to the tomb, all those thoughts, all those doubts, all those questions of why, I'm sure Peter was like, man, I have denied my Christ and I'm sure he's like, where has he gone? And maybe those doubts about Jesus begin to turn into faith. And Peter, his personality, it says that he runs right into the tomb without any hesitation. But maybe John just hesitates just a little bit. And he walks in. And when he sees the linen... When it sees the cloth, it says that he saw and believed. In verse 9, and they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to raise from the dead. They still didn't understand. Even though they saw and believed, they still didn't quite understand. You know, we can believe sometimes and not always understand. You know, our minds know what it thinks and our heart knows what it feels. And, and many say that seeing is believing. John saw and believed, but it says that Peter saw and he didn't, maybe he didn't quite believe fully or understand. Maybe there's still some of this doubt in his mind. And many times we come to our faith with maybe a sense of doubt or questions or why. But the thing is we have a choice. We have a choice of whether to act on our faith or to act on our doubt. You see, we know what our hearts feel. We know what our mind says. We know what our, our wills have experienced. But the question is this, is how do we know what we believe is real? How do we know that we can have real faith? How do we know that we can believe? Virgil John saw something when he looked in that tomb that day, and he knew immediately that Jesus was alive. And for us today, it's important to be able to have that same kind of certainty. If Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, then all of this Jesus stuff that we do is a waste of our time. Everything that we believe hangs on an empty tomb. And so how do we know that the tomb was empty? Are there things that we can see and then come away with some valid and rational and compelling reasons to believe that Jesus really is alive? Now, spoiler alert, I think that the answer is yes, right? Um, I, it, resoundingly so. I believe that God has given us super compelling reasons that point to the reality that Jesus died and that he lives again. And there are dozens that we could point to. I'm going to give you two and a half because I'm up against a time limit, Matthew, okay? Um, and these resonate with me. Number one, in the first century, Jewish people ditched Judaism. Just weeks after Jesus was crucified, a, a conservative estimate is that over 20,000 Jewish people suddenly begin to operate as if their Jewishness doesn't matter anymore. They begin to worship on Sunday instead of a Saturday. They begin to worship a human man as God himself. They, they abandon the temple as the place to meet God and to find forgiveness. They say that now they are the temple of God and they have received forgiveness once and for all. 
by way of a cross. Uh, the Jews were people who did not associate with non-Jewish people. We, we call them Gentiles, and they didn't eat their food. They stayed away from them. We could say that the Jews perfected social distancing before it was a thing, okay? They lived that way. That was their lifestyle, and yet suddenly, curiously, those barriers disappear, and they begin accepting Gentiles as fellow worshipers, and they start eating all of the forbidden Gentile food that suddenly starts showing up at the church potlucks. And do you remember your first experience with bacon? It was life-changing, right? Life-changing. Now, no good Jew would do any of these things. And so why did they? And let's note right away that it wasn't because of a book called the Bible. As important as the Bible is, the Bible did not exist. So what happened? It's not because of something they read, it's because something happened, and that something caused droves of Jewish people to rewrite centuries-old theology and ways of worship literally overnight. And there's only one thing that you can point to in the first century that can explain that, and it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. They saw and they believed. Here's the half, okay? The historical realities that took place from the first to the fourth century. In the first century, this teeny group of outcasts with no education, no standing, no resources, they managed to launch this movement that is centered on the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they are hunted down and they are really killed, actually killed for what they preach. They should have been wiped out from the beginning, but they weren't. They grow and by the fourth century, they take over the Roman Empire. Even the Roman emperor becomes a Christian. And they take over the most powerful society in their day without ever swinging a sword, without ever fighting one battle. Now, how do they do that? Uh, historically, you can't brush that under the rug. It happened. It cannot be denied. And the thing that makes sense of it is that in the beginning, they experienced something worth dying for. And it started an unstoppable movement of God. And what was that thing? We know, right? It was an empty tomb. It was a living Savior. They saw and they believed. Here's number three, is uh, the way that the earliest Christians write about what they saw. Uh, they put the story of Jesus on paper, and it's what they include that we need to pay attention to. And one of those things is that the women were the first witnesses to a resurrected Jesus. That's what they write. And they do this in a day where the testimony of a woman was actually inadmissible in a court of law. Think about that one. Also, they write really unflattering accounts of themselves. They write that they were cowards, that they were dense, that they ran away. And the best explanation for them to include all of these details is that they really happened. They saw and they believed. But my favorite, my favorite is the way that they write about their doubt. Here's what Luke in Acts says. He says that a resurrected Jesus had to give his disciples many convincing proofs that he was alive. That's totally unexpected. Even these first eyewitnesses doubted what they were seeing, and every one of us has been in that boat. We've all said, oh God, if, if, if I just had proof, if Jesus would just show up and present himself, then all my doubt would be gone. If I could just touch his nail scars, or he could just show up and tell me that one thing that only I know about, right, then I will believe. But listen, it's never even even occurred to you that all of those things could happen and you still might not believe. But that's exactly what happened to the disciples. Simply seeing a risen Jesus didn't automatically bring them to belief. Jesus had to show up and prove that it was really him and prove that he was really alive. And you can't make that up. Who would know? that it was even possible to still doubt after seeing a risen Lord face to face other than people who have seen a risen Lord face to face and still doubt. See, just like the disciples, maybe Jesus walks through your walls today into the room where you're sitting right now. If that happens, you still might doubt. There's only one thing today that can bring you to the place of, of certainty, and it's this commitment. It's what Virgil was talking about. It's making the choice to believe. 
there was a Muslim college student who came to believe in Jesus, and one of his friends was shocked and asked, why in the world did you, did you become a follower of Jesus? And he said, it's simple. I want you to imagine that you're walking down a road, and you come to a fork in the road, and there are two people there, and you get to choose one of those people to follow as your guide the rest of the way. And one of them is dead, and one of them is alive. Which one do you follow? There's a choice to be made today. Will you follow the ideas and thoughts that lead to a grave and nowhere else, or will you follow a way that can lead you out of that grave and into life? We have valid, logical, reasonable evidence, just like John when he looked into that tomb to believe that the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. And Matthew, that changes the game. Suddenly, Christ matters, Christianity matters, because he is risen. He's risen indeed. indeed. Yeah. This is how this works, friends. There, there always comes a time, though, in our lives when, when we see all of the evidence and we hear all the truths and we, we read the stories and we encounter other people where it, there has to be a move that we make. It, it's a move from this intellectual disbelief to an internal choice to believe. Where, where we have this crossover from our mind to our heart where all of a sudden the, the doubts that we once had are now swallowed up in a faith that we have chosen to believe. I See, I, I don't think a doubt is the same as disbelief. I think there's a difference. There's a difference between doubts and, and disbelief. See, I think doubting is actually a part of the process where the outcome is a belief. But disbelief is a choice to not believe. Think of it like this. There are two statements. I believe in the resurrection. It's a statement of belief. I believe that the resurrection didn't happen. It's a statement of disbelief. Both require faith. And both are a choice that we can make. See, it is a choice to believe that actually helps us switch around to see things differently, where we cross over from seeing to believing to believing, therefore we see a little bit clearer. The word saw in this text of John chapter 20, it occurs in many, many different tenses, over 10 different times actually. And that word saw is in the original language, the word theo rio, theo rio. And it means this, to behold, to view attentively to perceive, to look with a sense of purpose, to closely scrutinize, and to look with this intention and this ability. It's, it's the ability to look, to have this doubt whispering in your mind, but still see beyond your doubts. It's this movement that takes place. See, faith is making a decision to believe despite the uncertainty. See, I don't believe that doubt is the opposite of faith. Nor do I believe that fear is the op opposite of faith. I actually believe that the opposite of faith is certainty. See, because when you are certain, you don't actually need faith. But if we're going to come to God, Scripture tells us in Hebrews, if anyone wants to come to God, he must choose to believe. He must have faith because without it, we can't really see or please God. Uh, growing up, I, believe it or not, played a little bit of basketball. And uh, as I played basketball, one of the things uh, that, that we, uh, we discover or we know is that in, in the course of, of playing basketball, you kind of learn how to dribble, and the goal is to get the ball into the hoop and to get as close as you can. And I, I never was a very big guy. I, I was a little bit quick, and uh, so I always kind of played on, on the perimeter. And there's a move that you can make in basketball when you have a defender on you and you're dribbling in one direction, going in one way, and it seems like there's a block. They're, they're, they're impeding your path to your goal or, or to the hoop. There's a move that you can make. It's called the it's called the crossover, right? You just dribble between your legs, behind the back, do a spin move, cross it from this hand over to this hand, and all of a sudden you, you have a different path 
towards the goal. There's this crossover that happens. It's this, this juke move, if you will. Sometimes they're spectacular to watch. Uh, mine were never really all that spectacular. Let's, let's be real clear. Uh, but some of them are spectacular. And the goal of the crossover is to help you move beyond a defender and beyond the defense, the one that is impeding your way. It's a change of direction. It's a, it's a decision. You're going one way and now you're going a, a different way. It's a, it's a crossover. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said this. He says, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes in him who sent me, has eternal life and will not be judged, but passes, or the NIV says, but has crossed over from death to life. There's a crossover. Jesus was the first person to throw the juke at the enemy, right? It was the Jesus juke of all time. He did the ultimate crossover. See, what he did at the cross allows you and I to get beyond this separation from God, crossing over the gap of our sin to having a real relationship with Jesus. Because what Jesus did at the tomb, we get to believe in a risen, resurrected, living forever Savior. And we cross over from temporary death to eternal life. There is a belief that happens. It's, it's because what he did at the cross that we no longer have to live with sickness, but we get to walk in health. We get to move from sin to forgiveness, from offense to forgiving others. We get to see the cross over because what Jesus did at the cross, what Jesus did at the tomb was the ultimate crossover, and we get to be the benefactors of, of it. Jesus Christ is our crossover Savior. Jesus Christ is the one who comes. And when we have him as our Lord, when we believe in what he did, he becomes the ultimate crossover, and that crossover helps us see differently. Just like in basketball when you're dribbling one direction and you can't see a clear path to the goal, but you choose to do the crossover move, you now see a new path. You now see opportunity where it used to be impossibility. And that's what Jesus does. See, the crossover helps you see it differently. Where you start to see possibility where it was impossible. That's what the disciples saw. They saw that what was impossible, somebody coming back to life, was now possible again. They, they saw that, that, that where there was brokenness, now there could be restoration in your heart and in my heart. See, Jesus came to be the ultimate crossover. Isaiah prophesied this of old when, when he said that when the Son of Man comes, he's going to be anointed. And he's going to be anointed to bring freedom to the captives, to claim, to give sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are bound. See, that's good news for us when we believe in Jesus as our crossover savior he moves us from death to life from impossible to possible from broken to made whole it, it allows us to see it differently to where we see a dark sky but all of a sudden the sunrise begins to break through the day there is a crossover that happens in your marriage there's a crossover that can happen in your finances there's a crossover that can happen in your heart it's a crossover that moves from hope from a place of hopelessness you know you know pastor eric we, we were talking and i really do think that the crossover savior helps us move from a temporary hopelessness to an eternal hopefulness. You're right. You're absolutely right. I've been thinking a lot about hope uh, these last couple of uh, couple of weeks, a last while. And uh, hope is something that the world could use a lot of right now. Uh, the, uh, really, that's true, pandemic or not. Um, the reality is, usually we talk about hope, and we use the word hope, and the word we use often conveys doubt. Uh, you might hear someone say, Man, I sure hope we, I sure hope I can pass this test, or or uh, I, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, or man, I hope I get I ask what I asked for for Christmas. Is is that hope? Is that is that really all there is to it? And in the Old Testament, the word the Hebrew word that's translated into the English as hope is bata. And bata has connotations of confidence, security, being without care. The Greek word used in the New Testament has some of the exact same connotations. One source said this: biblical hope 
is a confident expectation or assurance based upon a sure foundation for which we wait with joy and full confidence. There's no doubt about it. That's the kind of hope that we enjoy as believers. We've been talking about the different facets of the Easter story. Jesus' life, the crucifixion, the resurrection, why it's necessary, why it happened, why it matters, whether or not we believe. And uh, it's, it's all of these truths that give us a beautiful hope. Regardless of our external circumstances, we have a living hope, a current hope. Because we have a risen Savior who's alive today. In 1 Peter 1.3, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I heard a story about a youth pastor that was talking about Easter to his teens. And he said, Jesus died and rose for you. And one of the teenagers spoke out and said, so what? You might not holler it out like that, but maybe you've got the same question. So what? Why does this really matter? Why does the stuff that these guys are talking about, why is it supposed to give me hope? Well, for one, because it's a secure, solid hope. Pastor Dusty talked about the reality of the resurrection. Uh, the historical account is solid. Pastor Virgil, uh, you read from John. You could read it in any of the other Gospels. The tomb was empty. Jesus' resurrection was corroborated by over 500 eyewitnesses. Placing your hope and trust in Jesus Christ is one of the most secure things that you can do. Sure, there's, there's faith. Uh, there's, there's a point where you've got to step out and, and you've got to decide whether or not you're going to believe for yourself. But faith in the truth claims of the Bible are not just a, a, a blind stab in the dark. God's Word tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Christian faith is rooted and grounded in reality and surety. So is our hope. Jesus really rose from the dead. But it's not just a secure, solid hope. Like Peter said, it really is a living hope. Colossians 3.1 tells us that Jesus is currently seated at the right hand of God. And this is especially encouraging to me right now, to understand that Jesus is alive right now because things are pretty crazy. There's a lot of uncertainty. Nothing is set in stone. Nothing is secure. Probably most of the plans that we'd set at the beginning of the year are canceled at this point. Who knows? Maybe plans that you're making today are going to change by tomorrow. But beyond that, people are dealing with the reality that this world is just a pretty crazy, uncertain place. I have friends who've recently been shocked with with an unexpected cancer diagnosis. I've got friends who recently went through a miscarriage. Friends who just lost a family member. We're all connected to people who are facing uncertain circumstances. Maybe we're the ones that are facing them. And it can be easy to look at this stuff going on around us and get pretty overwhelmed. Maybe even to the point that we start to feel a little hopeless. I mean, it's all well and good that Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, but how does that give me hope when right now I'm laid off from my job and these unpaid bills are staring me in the face? Maybe you can relate to the discouragement that Jesus' disciples must have felt before the resurrection. I can only imagine what they must have felt. Pastor Virgil talked about that a little bit. In fact, you know, they, they, they must have been downright depressed, feeling pretty, pretty hopeless. The one they'd believed in was dead. And then the resurrection happened. And the resurrection changes everything. The disciples' lives were never the same after the resurrection. And it wasn't because the world wasn't a crazy, uncertain place anymore. It wasn't because they didn't have any more troubles. In fact, as, as Pastor Dusty said, they, they had quite a bit of troubles. In fact, they eventually were persecuted and killed for their faith. Their lives weren't changed because of the absence of troubles. Their lives were changed because of the resurrection. Because they made the commitment to follow a living Savior and place their trust in Jesus Christ as their living hope. And we can make the same choice. Things change. Circumstances are uncertain. But Hebrews 13.8 tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He never changes, and he still invites whoever believes on him to have everlasting life. He is the living hope that sustains us in our uncertain circumstances. Another awesome truth about the hope that Jesus' resurrection gives us today is that it's an eternal hope. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. John 4.14, Jesus said, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 5.24 says, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. 
He doesn't come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. We could go on and on and read more verses. Jesus' resurrection defeated death. It gives us eternal hope. The Bible tells us that God put eternity in our hearts. We were made to last forever. And choosing to believe on Jesus and follow him in obedience gives us the hope of spending all eternity face to face with Jesus Christ himself. The resurrection gives us a secure, solid, living hope. I don't know what you might be dealing with today. Maybe you don't feel like there's much hope. Maybe you have doubts and uncertainty, and Jesus is calling you to believe in his completed work on the cross. That the cross helps us to overcome sin, sickness, separation from God, and brings us from death to life. Whoever you are, wherever you are, you can have hope today because the resurrection changes everything. If you're ready to take your first steps toward following Jesus, each of our churches is ready to help you. You can text the keyword Easter to the text line 620-604-9280. And we will send you a link with contact information for each church so you can take your first step toward following Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the hope that you've given us. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you that whoever believes on you can have eternal life. Thank you, Lord, that you rose from the dead. And today, Lord, you live in victory and you offer a personal relationship with each and every one who believes on you. If there's anyone tuning in today that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, God, would you give them the grace and the courage they need to take the steps to follow you. Bring them from death to life, from darkness into light. Give them hope. Thank you for how you're going to answer our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, friends and family, I hope today's message was life-giving for you. I want to ask you to take a next step and go ahead and click the subscribe button so you never miss another chance to have an encounter with God. And while you're at it, take another step and share it with a friend. Maybe post it on your social network or text a coworker the link. And when you do that, you are partnering and get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in them. Hey, if Faith Church has made an impact in your life, if these messages are helping you gain traction in your faith, would you consider partnering with us financially? When you do that, it helps us widen our reach so that more people can have an encounter with the real Jesus. You can find information and ways to give on our central hub, faithchurchks.org. If, if you live in the Southeast Kansas region, we'd love to see you in person at one of our Sunday services. You can find those times on our hub as well, faithchurchks.org. Hey, remember this, God is for you and we love you.